when envy and ambition become the ruler of our lives, and many times it becomes the ruler of our lives and we don't even realize it, the terrible things can result, not only to us, but to those people who are around us. We are continuing on in a series which is called Lessons from a Guy uh, Named Jacob. Uh, Hopefully you have learned a thing or two as we've kind of gone on. Uh, You learn about people. This is why this this lesson is so important because Jacob was a mess. And um, not only was he a mess, the people around him were a mess. And, and, And God still in the process takes him on a journey of a person who is a mess, a deceiver, a grabber. And brings him into one who strives with God. We're on that same journey. But not only do we learn about Jacob, we learn about the family around him and some of the things that were taking place. And the only word that comes to my mind when I talk about the family of Jacob is this. Two words. Jerry Springer. Has anybody ever watched Jerry Springer? Have you ever watched it? I know we're all religious people and we don't watch that, but there have been times where I've kind of sat and caught five minutes or ten minutes of, uh, of Jerry Springer and, until I get so disgusted and, 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 and like it's like a circus. Family members coming on, uh, talking about others, just a whole bunch of things which are taking place. But if there is, if there is a story um, to talk about that, that's, that, uh, that symbolizes itself Um, to the Bible, it would be something that Jerry Springer would have on uh, his particular show. And it is full of a whole bunch of things. Uh, Do you ever notice that in every family there is a black sheep? Do you have someone in your family that is crazy, for lack of a better term? Even as I'm saying that, there's probably one or two that you're thinking of in the family that, you know, you try and avoid maybe during Christmas dinner or something like that. But what happens if there is no crazy one? Well, the chances are you are that crazy person. You're the one that they probably avoid. But what happens, really, what happens when everyone is crazy? What happens when the whole group has kind of flown off into the deep end? Well, you get what we be what we would call a Jerry Springer situation, and so today I want to share with you a crazy story, but an important story for us to understand today. And if you're if you're joining us online, welcome. And I'm hoping that you can relate and allow this to resonate for you because it, it deals with all of us in general, but for a few of us in particular. And I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit can use my words to minister to your heart because this is a story which is about a crazy contest. And it's filled with ambition and envy and jealousy and bitterness and superstition and attributing things to God that God never orchestrated and conniving and idolatry and rejection and heartbreak. And despite all of this which is going on, God still seems to love and move and extend grace to people who don't have it all together. And therewith, it becomes important to us because we find ourselves in a time where we need to desperately allow grace to rule. Would you agree? I don't know how many conversations I've had this week where I have made that statement that we need forgiveness and we need grace to rule. You might be right, your opinion might be this way or that way, but ultimately at the end of the day, we are the body of Christ and we need to allow grace, forgiveness to rule. So let me tell you about a contest. Now this is, this is what I will call a narrative sermon. And, and the reason I'm going to be presenting it this way is because it extends two chapters of scripture and it's very hard to read two chapters of scripture and allow you to be able to take in all the things that uh, it is about. And so, like I said, it is about everybody. Because if there was a word that I was going to use to describe uh, the story mentioned in Genesis chapter 29 and 30, it is about the poison, the poison of envy. And the thing about envy is, is that all of us have envy to a certain degree, but none of us want to admit 
that we have envy. To define envy basically is this. That envy is a distress over another person's success. People have referred it, Shakespeare referred it to the green-eyed monster. Envy is never, is very clever at hiding itself. And like I said, I never really like to admit the fact that I can be an envious person. Because when I admit to you that I am an envious person, I also have to admit that I'm not established in my identity with Christ. That I'm ungrateful for the things that God has given me that I compare myself in a carnal way with my brothers and sisters, and that I function with a spirit of competition in the body of Christ. If I could just say I envy, that's one thing, but it's the domino that tips over all the other dominoes. But if I can face the fact that I have envy, then I think I'm on my way to healing. Because you can never be healed of something that you don't, that you aren't aware of and that you don't confess. That's why James says, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another so that you might be healed. Envy is one of those things that James talks about. He says, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your life, he says, don't boast and lie against the truth. And it goes on in verse 16, it says, for where envy and uh, self-seeking exists, confusion and every." evil thing are there. Pretty intense things that James has to say. He says it's kind of like a distorted mirror. You kind of look at it and, and, and it just seems things seem to be bigger than what they really are. And, and envy, just uh, Bob Sorge, incredible author, in his book called Envy says, it involves the spirit of bitterness and the spirit of murder. Envy is the thing that caused Cain to kill Abel. Envy is casting longing eyes on what God has on our neighbor. Envy or covenanting is the tenth of the Ten Commandments. That's how serious it is. It masquerades as a normal motivation. Anytime the Pharisees showed envy towards Jesus, they did it in a way by saying this, hey, you're disobeying the law. You're not a spiritual person. And so envy has a way of masquerading and sliding under the the carpet. It is stealth. It is, it is, it, sometimes it doesn't show on the radar. But if it's left untapped, if it continues to grow and develop, then terrible repercussions happen. And so here we have what I will call the contest. The contest starts with what I will call the rivalry. Now, if you were here last week, we talked about an incredible experience that Jacob has God speaks to him, and he devotes himself to God, to Jehovah. And then he begins his journey, which he was supposed to take, and we begin to talk about his secondary family. And if you thought the first family that he was involved in was crazy, they don't even hold a candle to the second one. Because what happens is a time where he meets up with Rebecca's brother Laban. And to understand the story of what is going on here about the contest, you first have to look at Laban. Many people think, well, it's a story about Leah and it's a story about Rachel. But Leah and Rachel would have never been in the place that they were if it wasn't for their dad, Laban, who was actually the uncle of Jacob. Now, we first hear about Laban, not in in Genesis 29 and 30. We actually hear about him in Genesis chapter 24 when Isaac meets up with Rebecca. And there's a key statement that happens at that particular time in Genesis chapter 24, verse 30. It says says this, that as soon as Laban saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arm, and he had heard Rebecca tell about the man he said to her, he went out. So right at the very beginning, when you hear about this fellow Laban, you realize that he has a an eye for the things which are best for him. He makes himself to be a wonderful person, a hospitable person, even a godly person. But everything he did was to make sure that he was on the top and to understand the life of Laban. You need to realize that he was what we would call in today's vernacular an opportunist. He took the best of the opportunity. 
And as we read on in the story, Jacob comes and meets up with the family. He falls in love with Rachel. He wants to meet up with Rachel. And there's another sister, an older sister. Her name is Leah. And when they describe Leah in Genesis chapter 27, it says this. Rachel was beautiful. And they said Leah had delicate eyes, weak eyes. Now, how am I supposed to interpret that? Now, if you go on some type of a dating site and they try to describe yourself and you say, well, he's got nice eyes. What does that say to you? If you're going on a dating site and they say, this person has a wonderful personality. You know what that's code for? This person don't look too good. Or at least in comparison to the sister. And so Laban fixes up a deal to marry Rachel. And after working for him for free for seven years, the wedding begins. And there was what was called a switcheroo. Another fantastic word. We're learning all kinds of fantastic words. Switcheroo. Who thought of that word? We know switch, but all of a sudden the aru makes it even more fantastic. We don't use aru with any other words. How are you, happy? Oh, I'm happy aru. No, it doesn't fit, it only works with switch. The switcheroo happens. And what happens is that it must have been dark. I can't explain the whole thing to you. What happens is in the middle of the night or in the process, Jacob ends up lying with Leah instead of Rachel. I have to think that Leah was probably part of the plan. And Rachel was part of the plan. Either that or they won't. And they just did what their dad told them to do. And so Jacob wakes up, realized, realizing that him being a deceiver was deceived. And he's angry. Can you imagine how Leah feels over all this? I want the other sister. I want Rachel. And so Laban goes to spin the web that he has, and he says, you know what? You've got to marry off the first one before I marry off the second one. And so he agrees to marry Rachel. And he works another seven years. For 14 years, he works for free for these girls. And he twists and he turns the whole thing. And, and it's interesting that Laban cares for people as long as people don't get ahead of him. He also appears to be in favor of God of Israel. But if you take a look at the story, if you take a look at Genesis chapter 27, he says that some of the things that he got was because of a fortune teller, because of divination. You'll read later on that the lights went out and nobody could see. You'll read on later what had taken place um, was that... Um, I've lost my train of thought now. I've been thrown off in left field. Um, you'll, you'll learn as, as well that what happened was that Jacob um, and, and Laban also carried idols with him everywhere that he went. So it appears that he loved the God of Jacob, but he loved the God of Jacob only in respect to what could get him ahead. And so as you read on in the story, what happens is Jacob ends up making a deal with Laban, which highly favors Laban. But God moves, and all of a sudden, the sheep and the goat and all the livestock, everything that goes with it, ends up going with Jacob. Well, what do you think happens from there? Well, in Genesis chapter 31, verse 2, it says this, And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude towards him <laughs> was not what it had been. Why is that? Because there's an envy lesson here. The envy lesson is this. That with envy, we want to, um, we have no problem weeping with those who weep. But we certainly have a problem rejoicing with those who rejoice. That person's going through a terrible time. That's terrible. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray that God blesses them. And God does bless them. Praise the Lord. God bless them. God continue to bless them. And God does bless them. But he blesses them to the point where he goes past you. And all of a sudden, they're doing better than you. And then what happens from there? Well, I don't know if I like this. See, 
Envy will weep with those who weep, but has a trouble rejoicing with those who rejoice. The other lesson that we end up learning from this um, is, is this, um, that envy, a person who has envy, will often have children with the same issue. That envy, folks, is highly, highly contagious. That it is passed down. And another thing that we learn about, Len, about envy from this is that envy, many times, is a problem between brothers and sisters. You see, as a pastor, I don't envy people like Billy Graham or people who are high up. I envy other pastors. And a youth pastor, he won't envy the senior pastor. He or she will envy other pastors. You see, it's a problem between the brothers, isn't it? It's an issue between Cain and Abel, between Isaac and Ishmael. It's between Joseph and his brothers. And before ladies, you say, yes, that's true. I know all guys are envious and they need to be dealt with. Not only is it an issue with them, it is an issue between Sarah and Hagar and Hannah and Paniah, and in this particular case, Rachel and her sister, Leah. And it deals with, of all things, a baby contest. You've got to be kidding, a baby contest. Well, at that particular time, it was extremely important to have offspring, particularly boys, to carry on your legacy, to carry on your name. And all of a sudden, you realize that Leah, although she may not have been the best looking, was certainly the most fertile. And Rachel was good looking, but for some reason, couldn't conceive. And you hear uh, Genesis chapter 31 say this, when the Lord had saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. And if you go on to Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, it says this, <laughs> Rachel, when she saw that she could not give Jacob a baby, says this, give me children or else I die. It's that serious. And so this builds up. It becomes a difficult situation. And already right off the start, it's Rachel, or sorry, Leah four, Rachel zero. So what happens, envy does this. Envy never ever leaves you in a good place. You're never ever a better person because of envy. You'll never hear a person say, well, since I have allowed this envy into my life, I am a much happier person. No, there's misery which is extended. So Rachel has a solution. And you see in verse three, it says this. Rachel says this, here is my, here is my maid Bilhah, go and marry her and she will bear a child on my knees. What? That sounds crazy. But at that particular time, it was totally an acceptable thing to do. And the term having a child on my knees basically was this, that when the maid had the baby, it was laid upon the lap of, the, uh, of Rachel, of the person that, was, that, was, that she was her, her mistress, whatever you want to put it. It's part of what was a code that was called the Code of Hammurabi. It didn't have Jewish law established at that particular time. Centuries earlier, the Code of Hammurabi was the thing that existed, and the Code of Hammurabi basically said this. If you can't have children, then it is a totally acceptable thing to have your handmaid have those children for you so that you could pass on the family name. Now, it was the Hammurabi Code, but it certainly wasn't God's Code. There's nowhere in Scripture where it says that this is okay that they were getting the morality from a worldly code. Sometimes we do the exact same thing. So what happens is she has a baby. The handmaid of, of, of Rachel has a baby. And this is what Rachel says. She says, she says in, this, in verse 6, she says, God has judged my case and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. And... That's what she thought. That's what she said. And we figure because it said it in the Bible, it's true. That's not what God thought. 
That's not what God wanted. There's a whole bunch of legal language in here that says basically God has ruled on my side. No, it's not the case. The thing is that envy will distort the truth. What God is really trying to say. What a crazy story. Don't you think? Well, it gets more crazy. It gets even worse than that. In verse 9, all of a sudden, Leah says, well, two can play that game. In verse 9, it says this. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her, her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Now, if you're counting here, folks, not only is there two wives, there are now four wives. And I don't have to be a genius to tell you that there's a whole lot of problems with that. Isn't it true? And so what happens is Zilpah gives two children in the name of Leah. The score is now six to two. But there's hope. All of a sudden, there's a story that comes about in this story where, where Leah has her son Reuben. And Reuben is kind of going around in the fields, and he picks up a thing which is called mandrake. I'm not too sure if you know what a mandrake is. But at that particular time, it was very special. And a mandrake was kind of a root that had come out, kind of looked like a carrot. But many times if you pulled out a mandrake, what happened was the root would look kind of like a human being. And so at that time, people felt that it was an aphrodisiac, that it would open the womb. And this became incredibly important to Rachel because she hasn't been able to have a child. And so what she does is she goes to Leah and she says, please, can you give me the mandrakes that your son Reuben has? This is the response in verse 15. Wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you now take away my son's mandrakes too? Now, if I think a little bit, it almost seems like Leah took away Rachel's husband. Things are kind of getting a little bit more conscrewed. And this was Leah's response. Wasn't it enough you took away my husband, you now take away my mandrakes too. But basically, Rachel says this very well. If that's the case, you can sleep with Jacob tonight in a trade for the mandrakes. Is this not crazy, folks? Do you not take a look at this and say, this is just kind of whacked out weird? And Leah accepts. So when, Le when Jacob came out from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him. And she says this, you must sleep with me, she said, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. I think by that time you're starting to feel like a piece of meat, don't you think? <laughs> Obviously, Leah was not sleeping with Jacob at this time. So what ends up happening? Well, the mandrakes don't work, but Leah does. Leah has two more children. So now the score is eight to two. And Rachel still doesn't have a baby. The next lesson is this. Envy will lead us to resort to our own empty devices instead of actually trusting in God. You see how twisted it becomes? But despite all that, you read ahead one or two more verses that says this in verse 22. When God remembered Rachel, he listened to her and enabled her to conceive. And Joseph comes along. Later, Benjamin comes along. And at the heart of this, there are two hurt girls who received an inheritance from their father, Laban, that caused a lot of pain to go on in their lives. Laban could have said, listen, you just need to trust in the Lord. Listen, we need to trust that God is going to do, but that wasn't the case. They inherited the envy, which tore them apart. And there were two main things that takes place in these girls that I think resonate with us today. First is this, rejection. 
Leah's feelings of rejection were absolutely obvious. She was a hurting individual. Just take a look at how she names the first three of her children. In Genesis 29, verse 32, it says, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, and she said, It's because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Wow. Next verse, another baby comes along, Simeon. It says, Because the Lord has heard that I am not loved, he has given me this one too. One verse later, a third child comes. This is what it says. Now at last my husband will become attached to me. Wow. I don't know, but that's kind of a clue that I think she might have felt a little bit rejected. Have you ever felt rejection? Maybe as you are sitting here right now, you can relate 100% to how Leah was feeling. Many times if I get talking about rejection and say, have you been rejected? Most people who have suffered rejection will usually go to one or two instances in their life. It doesn't take long to talk about rejection. And when, and when we begin to talk about rejection, you just realize that it is deep and it is raw and that it's a lifelong hurt. And sometimes that rejection comes in the form of a spouse. Sometimes it comes in the form of a parent. I've been in my office many times, and I have heard stories of men and women who have sought the favor of a father who has rejected them, and they continue to do things to impress him, and he has been dead for over 10 years. Sometimes it isn't the parent. Sometimes it isn't the parent or the spouse. Sometimes it's the church. It's the reason why we have gotten the reputation as being the only army that shoots its wounded. Maybe it's a peer group. Maybe it's the rejection from something I'm not even talking about. Maybe you get rejected from your children. Or maybe you have been the rejector and you realize what you've done and you live with the pain that you have hurt somebody extremely deep. How do you recover from rejection? I don't think it's easy. In many cases, it has to do with an inner work of the Holy Spirit. And if you are here and you come carrying the burden of rejection, I believe that you don't have to leave with it. What did Rachel do? Let's take a look at the fourth child. When Judah came along, this is what she said. This time, I'll praise the Lord. The other three, she sought the attention of her husband. Finally, by the time child four came, she got it right. I'm going to get my peace and love and fulfillment in the Lord. That's how it's going to work. And that's how it works with us. There's a verse in Philippians chapter 27, verse 10. It says, even if my mother and my father abandon me, the Lord will hold me up. Jesus says this, if the world hates you, hate me first. There's a scripture in Psalm um, chapter 118 where it says, the stone that the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus knows about rejection, folks. And let me tell you, uh, Timothy Keller gave an illustration which I think is perfect. Imagine if after the service, a person comes to me and says, you know what? I don't like you. I'm going away, and you're never going to see me again. That would hurt, folks. It hurts when stuff like that happens. But if after the service, I go to my office, and my wife is there, and she says to me, I don't like you. I'm out of here. I never, ever want to see you again. The rejection is just a little bit deeper, wouldn't you say? Because it is the person that you have been with, the person that you have built relationship with. So you can imagine when Jesus was on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was between the relationship of two people in the Godhead who had been forever and eternity interlinked. God knows rejection. God knows what you are going through. And my encouragement is this. 
You can't live in the rejection. You got to say, this time I'm going to serve the Lord. The other side is this. Um, resentment. On the other side of the carnage was resentment. This is what represents Rachel. She was a hurting individual because she had absolutely everything that you could have. But she never had the one thing that she always wanted. God, give me a child or I will die. What is that one thing that you would die for? And this resentment takes on many forms. When the dream dies or when the hope dies or when the ambition is prevented or when a well-intended well plan fails or when, when unanswered urgent prayer doesn't take place. When life happens and you're left dejected, empty, angry. What do you do when impatience leads to disappointment? Let me tell you right now at this point, many, many Christians stop praying. They may not leave the church, but they stop praying. They think, I don't know if this actually works. And it becomes a difficult thing when frustration and unmet goals clash with what we always thought God would do. And what we always thought God would do was that he would always answer prayers our way in our time. And we realize, after just a few years of being a Christian, this isn't always true. But this is the most important request, God. This is the most important thing. Yeah, and can you explain to me, Pastor Mike, why I can't have a baby? No, I don't know. I can't understand. Maybe he's waiting. Maybe God's calling you for adoption. Maybe I'm not sure. Because God never really tells me some of these things. And there's a few times we'll all go away from a week meeting saying, God, I don't know. I don't have anything to tell him. But the fact remains this, that the solution for Leah was the exact same solution for Rachel. I got to trust God. I got to realize and I got to believe that God has his best intentions for me. There's lots of scriptures that support that. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Casting all your care on him because he cares for you. My grace is sufficient for you and my power is made strongest when you are weak. And if you take a look at Genesis 30, it eventually says this, then God remembered Rachel and he listened to her and enabled her to conceive. I don't know, folks. But one thing I found out is that when envy and ambition become the ruler of our lives, and many times it becomes the ruler of our lives and we don't even realize it, the terrible things can result, not only to us, but to those people who are around us. Ecclesiastes 4.4 says this. It says, I observed all the work and ambition motivated by envy. <laughs> what a waste. And if you believe that God has a plan for your life, and if I believe that God has a plan for my life, I have to trust them. See, the thing with envy is that it's a universal, global sin. It surpasses culture. It surpasses gender. It surpasses age. But I have to believe that if God has the best interest in mind for me, despite what I am facing right now, then I have to trust him. The question is, what is the circumstance that tempts you to look at others? Let me just say one thing before I close up. James chapter 3 talks about envy. I mentioned the scripture. It says, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. For where envy and self-seeking exist, there is confusion in every evil thing that are there. Wow. Let me just say this. If anybody knew about envy... It was James. Well, how do you know that? Because he was the brother of Jesus. Could you imagine living in the house with the Messiah, the sinless Son of God? I don't know if Mary said it, but there probably may have been one or two times where she said, you know, James, it would be a lot better if you were a little bit more like Jesus. And so, growing up, he had to live with the comparison of someone that was absolutely perfect. If anybody knew what it was like to deal with envy, it was him. 
So it's best to heed the words that he has to say. So God, I just pray right now in Jesus' name. Um, I know this sermon applies to everyone. But I also know that there are people who are in this congregation who are suffering. That there have been those people who have grown in, up in houses where they were the least favored child. That there are people that are part of the congregation who at one point their wife or their husband said, I don't know if I want to continue. And as they sit there, this morning, there is deep hurt, which can only be relieved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are those of us who have served God faithfully, and we've asked God for something, and it just hasn't come. And after a while, we just stopped praying. We just silently got bitter. So I'm going to serve the Lord, but I'm not going to serve Him the way I can and should. And we get overwhelmed by the resentment. But my prayer is today for those people who are part of that equation that this will be a miraculous time. That this will be a time where we'll say, okay, God, this time I'm going to serve you. I'm just going to give it to you. I'm going to allow the God of the universe who has my best interests in mind to take care of my life. So God, I pray that you do that. I pray for the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to flow through this place. For those people who are here online and they're just sitting and the Spirit of God is speaking to them right now. And they're dealing with the rejection. They're dealing with the, the resentment. And, and all they want to do is just give it to God. I pray, Father, that this will be a miracle time in their coffee table, living room, wherever they are. God, we want to serve you. God, you have a plan for our lives. And I don't want to do anything to prevent that from happening. So this morning, God, I hand all of my ambition, all of my envy, all of my comparison to you. Asking God that you will do something wonderful in my life, I pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Lots of stuff in the Bible, eh? Lots of things for, us to, things for us to chew on. When we stand at this time, Pastor Glenn is going to close things off for us. I want to open up the altar. Anyone who's here who needs to pray, uh, I'll be up at the front. If you need to pray, tap me on the shoulder. If you don't, I'll just let you pray. I'll let the Holy Spirit do the work. Amen? God bless you, Pastor.